Daredevil, The Man Without Fear, Matt Murdock, Marvel's badass blind lawyer. General audiences will know him best for his critically acclaimed 2015 TV series, his critically existent 2003 movie, and for being the funniest character to complete the races in Lego Marvel superheroes with. Probably shouldn't be putting him behind the wheel. It's the middle example that brings up our focus today. To be completely honest, I have not seen the Ben Affleck Daredevil as of whenever this video is up. I literally had to go to Wikipedia to verify my critically existent joke actually makes some sort of sense. It does if you also have not seen Daredevil 2003. That does not matter though. I previously discussed how superheroes usually only come out to play in big crossover titles, and yeah, Marvel loves using Daredevil in these. However, he barely is one of the exceptions to my statements. Daredevil has a whopping one game to his name, a tie-in to the aforementioned movie previously, but a different previously. I also discussed how different ports can practically get you different games under the same title, but he's also the exception to this statement, because Daredevil only got ported to a lonely single console, the Game Boy Advance. Everything else got cancelled. I'll go ahead and make the bold claim now. Daredevil's only game is almost great. You know, like the video title. Before I can get into that nagging modifier, I should lay down the deets. Daredevil is a side-scrolling beat-em-up with a little more focus on fisting dudes than jumping and platforming, although there certainly is a little of that too. It was developed by Gryptonite, who also did our last Game Boy discussion. While it is very loosely tied into the movie, it is practically its own thing. Elektra, Bullseye, and Kingpin all have the movie's looks, and several extras showcase movie stuff, such as a 32-bit Jon Favreau, but that's it. The story itself is wholly original, and the world is bright, colorful, and comic-y, as compared to the desaturation its movie apparently favored. Daredevil is even wearing bright crimson spandex instead of leather, bluffing about knowing what the color red looks like. The vibes are nice. A bit less muted than Frank Miller's famous run on the character, and not coincidentally, much less serious. So if you're only here to see female characters get retconned into prostitution, you will be disappointed. I really like the touch where you get a comic book style wham or pow or zing occasionally when an enemy or yourself gets KO'd. Levels themselves are consistently pleasing to look at, even if I didn't necessarily like the level itself, and always have great details for you to stop and take in, such as rat eyes peeking out from holes in the brick walls underground, or what is... potentially? A lingerie store named Something Pretty. There's just a lot of character for the world. Levels also typically move along at a good pace, which keeps things feeling fresh, although there are a couple of massive exceptions, which I will get into later. Visual design will only get you so far, of course, especially considering that GBA doesn't even have enough power to render Matt Murdock's double D chest. For our controls, we have a jump, which can be doubled, a basic punch, a different melee strike with Daredevil's Eskrima stick, and a special vision mode we will talk about shortly. If you are crouching, you sweep the leg, you can do a dive kick out of a jump, and you can perform this visually cool mid-air twirling kick if you melee right out of running. If I'm being honest, which I am, because why the shit would I lie about a Game Boy game? I obviously only lie about my sexual prowess and how many restaurants have restraining orders against me. The combat is the main thing holding the game back from greatness. It's not always bad, but Gryptonite has somehow hit a weirdly specific middle ground. When combat works, it's solid fun, if unoriginal. When combat doesn't work though, oh boy is it a slog. Basic melee frequently doesn't quite reach far enough, which I'm starting to just accept as a problem commonplace to old handheld games, but it is especially bad here when you're fighting baseball bat goons who have twice your reach. The twirling kick also somehow doesn't hit if you're too close, as if you've somehow kicked past their hitbox, and this is even assuming it works on command when you try it. More often than not, it happened because I was button mashing, and wouldn't happen when I wanted it to. 
A fully baked combat system would also have a significant difference between punching and a stick melee, and in theory there's a difference here, because some thugs are stunned by it, but others simply are not. There's also not a clear difference between the damage of either attack, although since enemies of the same type just seem to withstand different amounts of damage even in the same levels, it's not a very controlled environment to test it out in. More often than not, they feel very damage spongy, although occasionally they drop to the floor like the secretary in the obligatory porn joke I like to make on my videos. Sure. I too would drop to the floor like the secretary in the obligatory porn joke if Daredevil clunked me in the noggin. I just wish it were a little more consistent, preferably if it happened more often than less. The most glaring omission from the combat is the lack of a block button, which I think would genuinely improve things. Full disclosure, I almost always ignore the block button in games the way God intended, but at least then it would be my fault for dying. Kryptonite didn't use the select button or up on the d-pad, so there's room for it in the controls. As it stands, you're just sort of expected to take damage, since dodging is spotty at best, and success frequently just depends on health drops. 75% of the game accounts for this and drops enough health to succeed if you're playing well, but that remaining 25% just doesn't, and it frequently happens on longer stretches between checkpoints. It's this little detail that causes the combat to dive in quality from decent enough to success harder than the secretary, except this time it's a male secretary in the video. There are power-ups scattered around levels or dropped by enemies, which also hit the defining decent but not good enough to be great theme here. One turns your Eskrima Strike into an Eskrima Toss for a ranged stun move for a decent stretch of time, but it does have the downside of missing at normal combat range, so you will have to consciously back up to use it effectively most of the time. There's also a double damage power-up, which is nice to have, but still doesn't always speed things up enough, if that tells you anything about how sturdy these asshats are, and an invincibility power-up, which makes Matt look like an ugly, limber Robocop. Neither of these two power-ups last quite long enough, but it's not as bad as the power-ups from Grip the Knight's Lego Star Wars, and they are more welcome than not. There are also Red Devil Masks for additional lives, which cap out at 9, but I also only ran out during the final boss, where it just kicked me to the title screen without losing any level progress, so I don't know that these actually matter all that much. Finally, we have one collectible, where Daredevil runs around grabbing double Ds. The final level score actually comes from two things, how many of these you found and how much life you have remaining. The game does not care how many enemies you simply run past. If this weren't a movie tie-in, you could almost make an argument about pacifism or mercy or some shit like that. But you and I both know nobody was putting that much thought into this. Let's go back to that button I skipped with the special vision mode. See, while Daredevil is blind, he has also trained his senses to pick up the slack and essentially echolocate, but he's probably also doing a bunch of sniffing too. Sure, it would not be useful in a car, but it is useful in a fist fight. This button actually represents that. The backgrounds go gray, but enemies and objects take on this vibrant appearance. I finished one boss fight in this mode, and it even works on an NPC that only appears for dialogue, which is so dope. Vision modes aren't really anything uncommon now, but in 2003, on a Game Boy, that's a really fucking cool detail. Yet again, this still ends up being just shy of greatness. It's primarily used for hiding a few invisible collectibles or power-ups, but Daredevil also gets this blatant radar ping whenever he's near something invisible, so it's only hard to find this stuff if you're playing this game on the end of a selfie stick, and it appears to have no effect on normal combat. There's only one instance where it gets used in an actually clever way. You're fighting a villain on top of a train, which sometimes enters tunnels. She flails around aimlessly in the dark, and you, the player, can't see due to the tunnel wall, but switch to Daredevil's echo slash nasal location, and you're not bothered by such things, so you can get some free hits in while she's flying. It's a great moment representing what could have been if they'd given it 
just a little more effort. The vision mode also weirdly has a meter, but it refills automatically and pretty quickly, so I'm not sure why they bothered with the meter. I know game developers don't typically want players spending the entire game in specific vision modes like this, since the art team is practically itching to play golf with someone's kneecaps for pretty much any excuse, but it would have been cool to allow players to see the world through Matt's ears and nose the whole time. Unless, of course, that it's canon to the GBA-verse that he can also only see for five seconds at a time. If true, that's actually only the second fastest way to kill a Catholic clad head-to-toe in red fetish gear. We start off proceedings with some nearly monochrome stills of pixely Ben Affleck from the movie, and then we're slapped in the face by an immediate color whiplash. Daredevil is meeting up with Stick, the blind martial artist who taught him eagle vision. DD is like, hey man, you got any incriminating evidence on Kingpin? And fortunately, Stick does. The initial writing is, um, nearly indecipherable. Kingpin has made you a target for every crook in town, but he has made himself a target too. Crooks don't like bounties on their heads. This just sounds like gibberish, like the writer had a stroke in the middle of the paragraph and couldn't remember which noun was supposed to be the target, so he made all nouns the target. But it makes a little bit more sense later. It's still sloppy, but hang tight. Stick also tells Daredevil he, uh, saw Daredevil's old frenemy with benefits, Electra, leaving Kingpin's penthouse on her own accord. Some thugs confused me further on matters by saying, quote, collecting your bounty will be harder than you think, which did not clarify anything for me yet. The art design is top tier. There's a woman cowering to protect her baby from the thugs and the horny red man. Other civilians flee when combat breaks out. The graffiti on the first fence is the logos of the developer and the publisher. And as you're climbing the buildings, there's a very amusing billboard with the fantastic tagline, Cola, buy it. Matt catches up to Electra, who goes running into traffic, and we get a very cool level, hopping over moving cars while fighting thugs. Throwing in a cool set piece like this so early on definitely helped to hook me in, which is something that games like this frequently need to try harder at. It is funny how nonchalant the drivers are about this, but considering Marvel has like 7,000 superheroes in the same 35 mile diameter, this probably happens all the time. Daredevil corners Elektra on a dock where they fight. I'ma be real with you fam, I don't know what the fuck the strategy here is supposed to be, and yet I somehow still did not die. Elektra blocked pretty much everything I threw at her and nearly beat me, but then mostly stood on a crate above me where I uppercut her in the vagina until I won. I'm a Solid 77% certain that Griptonite did not program her vagina to be a weak point. Side note, I fucking love this big celebratory background when you beat a boss fight. Makes me think of wild berry Pop-Tarts every time. Electra snaps out of it, and apparently Kingpin used... brainwashing fight gas on her. She finally helped me clear up what the fuck the story was trying to say. Kingpin is publicly pretending he's putting bounties on the other bad guy's heads for Daredevil to collect, both to slander Dee Dee and to maybe cause him to get killed when the bad guys try to defend themselves against him. She leaves to put an ice pack on her labia, and we jump to a fun in-between scene with Matt Murdock and his legal partner Foggy Nelson, where a radio broadcast clues Matt in to the presence of Kirigi and his ninjas out on a dock. But a different dock. Kirigi thinks Daredevil's being a dishonorable piece of shit for working with Kingpin, but he can totally prove his innocence if he kicks all of the ninja ass. Double D fights through the dock, a shipping ship, and then a bridge where the traffic is very considerately not coming into our lane, before taking on Kirigi. His fight is a bit more structured, where he's using ninja skills and shit, but you can both jump up and cling to this overhead pipe. It's a decent fight. Took me a couple of tries, but nothing too bad. Stick shows up again to point Daredevil in the right direction, towards the Sewer King. I don't like this level. 
true gamers already know that sewer levels suck. They're already aesthetically unpleasing, but this is the first one where the difficulty gets out of whack here. The first section is way too long and drops far too little health compared to the hordes of enemies, many of whom have guns in areas where it's hard to dodge, so you're stuck getting sent back to the beginning over and over. It's just demoralizing. Also, and I'm certainly overthinking things here, but I'm a little bit uncomfortable with the premise here. These people are the king of the sewer's denizens, and with the exception of the gunmen, who are visually Australian and therefore fine to beat the crap out of, all of the enemies are clearly designed to evoke a look stereotypical to the unhoused population. Look, I frequently have to turn off the more leftist parts of my brain while enjoying superhero stuff due to the ways they sometimes depict the disadvantaged as outright bad guys instead of individuals forced into crime by desperation from systemic socioeconomic disparity. Why yes, I uh, I am very fun at parties, how did you know? Daredevil as a concept is already borderline weird if you think about it too much, because he's a devout Catholic extrajudicially beating the crap out of the guilty. I can ignore that kind of thing, because he's an interesting character, and that's clearly not anyone's intention, but I couldn't not overthink this level. You're running around assaulting the unhoused, literally people who have taken shelter in the sewers because they have nowhere else to go, and the story has established that they think they have no choice but to defend themselves. They think a bad man is paying a powerful fighting force to come in and get them. They're not out assaulting a woman and her baby. These are people experiencing the worst hardships in our industrialized capitalist hellscape, trying to habitate the only habitat they have, fearing for their lives. I'm telling you, I am so fun at parties. The second sewer section is at least more visually unique, since it's all across metal pipes, which is pretty cool looking, and sometimes you get to kick alligators in the face, which is super dope. Take that, you reptilian chuckle fucks. Sewer King, who looks precisely like a Frank Miller villain can reasonably be expected to look, goes down stupidly easy. His windup is really slow, and he fails to take much advantage of the steam pipes in his own strategy. What a fucking loser. We get another transitional scene with Foggy, so the radio can tell us about the next level. Some athletic chick is jumping around on trains demanding Daredevil show up. It's the villain Echo, who hopes to defeat Daredevil to steal his costume and start collecting Kingpin's bounty requests for herself. The first location, the subway stations, pick up the difficulty again, like the first area of the sewer, but at least it's pretty novel. You climb up to higher levels, but as you go, you'll sometimes be on the tracks and have to take cover from trains in these little hidey holes in the ground. The game gives you no warning whatsoever when a train is coming, but getting hit by one is apparently not that big of a deal since you don't take all that much damage. I sadly could not get any of the footage of the trains sharing a screen with any thugs, so I don't know if they actually get run over by the trains or not, but they appear to take zero damage themselves. Above ground the difficulty normalizes again and you fight your way below some elevated rails, then up onto the rails where thankfully trains don't run you over, then onto the tops of the trains properly where you occasionally take minor damage if you don't jump over the metal bars, which frankly came at me so fast I struggled to respond with the right timing. Finally, Echo's boss fight is the cool one I already mentioned that uses the vision mode, and then Stick is just magically around on a moving train, because this game only knows two methods to introduce each level. He points out that the assassin Bullseye, as well as the Yakuza, are conveniently in a construction site in this very neighborhood. The demolition site at the bottom, with wrecked buses and excavators and smashy metal things, is pretty fun. Once you start climbing the scaffolding, though, we have another case of artificial difficulty, which meant I ended up just trying to leave the Yakuza alone as much as possible, which is probably bad, considering how actually dangerous the Yakuza can be. There are also major platforming woes for the first time in the game. Earlier, 
there would be occasional moments where you can hang from and hop up specific bricks sticking out of the wall, and I didn't have any problems then. But this time, there are construction hooks you have to go up at much greater distances away, and I had great difficulty getting that right. Bullseye's boss fight is simple, but it still works well within the system limitations. He runs a few feet away and shoots you in the face. Still better than Deadshot's boss fight in Arkham City. Eventually, he gets desperate and starts throwing tools from the toolboxes lying around before he goes down. Dee Dee's finally had enough, so he goes to Kingpin's penthouse to stop this once and for all. Yes, that does mean he could have done this the whole time. Don't think about it. You first have to fight through eight consecutive floors in between checkpoints, which is not the most fun. Kingpin thanks you for taking out so many of his rivals for him, and we start the final boss fight. At first, I didn't like his boss fight. He starts by calling down several drones, which just mean you won't quite be at full health when you beat him, before he smashes his desk and comes after you directly. His only vulnerable area is his head, which is way up there, and though he really only has two strikes he can do, if you land a hit, he absolutely can land one back before you get away, and he dishes out much more damage than he takes. It took me several tries, but I finally figured out the strategy, and I'll begrudgingly admit that I respect what they're going for here. You have to get in close to feign an attack and dodge, and when he misses, you have time to dive kick him in the face before he has recovered. When he's finally taken enough damage from doing this a few times, he points out that you have no incriminating evidence to get him arrested, which is unfortunately just sort of a kingpin staple in Marvel media, but he will at least announce the fake deal is off so people will stop trying to fight Daredevil. We get one last scene of Matt Murdock listening to the radio, and turns out it was Kingpin's own Fisk Network News the whole time. It shows a few more context-free movie stills before credits roll, which seems to imply that this whole thing takes place in the middle of the movie somewhere, but after skimming the Wikipedia page again, that doesn't seem to make any sense. There are some fun extras here. Several characters have bios, although it's sadly only for the movie characters. So if you want to know more about Echo or the Sewer King, Gryptonite would like you to go eat your own crotch, nerd. There's also 32-bit recreations of a few classic Daredevil comic covers and a variety of concept or promotional art pieces to view. If any of you secretly masturbated to this Game Boy poster in your younger days, I compel you to admit it in the comment section. My favorite bit is how, if you collect all of the Daredevil logos in the game, which I definitely did and did not just use the unlock everything cheat code for sure, you can change Daredevil's costume into his original yellow and red costume from his first few issues, as well as giving Elektra bullseye and Kingpin their comics looks, too. It is weird that they just whitewashed Michael Clark Duncan's face in the top corner for that, but I am 100% not the person equipped to have that conversation. I know that a couple of times while discussing stuff like this, it's very easy to come across as negative. I'm not typically a negative person, but my interests keep overlapping with crappy shit, so that's come out some. Even with all of the problems here, though, I can't help but have mad respect for this game. It does not reach greatness, but I love that it is at least as good as it does manage. If you happen to find a copy of this in the wild for a good price, and it interests you, go ahead and pick it up. Nope, not for that much, though. <laughs>